Hey everybody, it's Mike with On Point Preparedness. I just wanted to do a quick little teaching video that I think you guys are really gonna like. It involves types and shadows and prophecy. But before we get to that, just to set the record straight because of the nature of the title, I don't want people to think that this video is about reaching out to unbelievers for prophetic guidance. It is not that at all. But I just wanna show you how God works even in using statements from unbelievers. It's gonna be really cool. I'd actually share this small little revelation that God had given me to one of my friends and an elder in the church. And he just sort of laughed because it was so neat um, to see this small prophetic insight. So I just wanna start with some scripture here. And it's about where a high priest in Jesus' day, the high priest Caiaphas, who actually decided to execute Jesus, how he spoke prophetic words. Um, he was not a believer in Jesus, obviously, because he said that this is heresy. This guy is saying that he's the son of God. We need to crucify him. He was not a believer. Yet scripture tells us plainly that he was speaking out prophecy, being the high priest for that year. So if we look at John 11, starting in verse 47, scripture says, So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered to council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. So it's very interesting. Caiaphas, as the high priest, was saying, hey, people are saying he's king of the Jews. Romans are going to hear this. They're going to think that there's a rebellion, that the Jews are going to have a king that is going to usurp Caesar. If they find this out, they're going to plunder us. It is better that this man die than the whole entire nation die. So he's only speaking from a fleshly perspective. He's only thinking about their physical lives. But scripture says plainly he was speaking prophetic words that he did not understand, that Jesus would die a spiritual atoning death for the sins of his people and save them, but not only them, but that grace would also be extended unto the Gentiles. So that was a really good example, which is stated plainly in scripture, how Caiaphas, the high priest, who was not a believer in Jesus and actually sentenced him to death, was used by God to speak a prophetic word. And so now I wanna show you the second instance of this, which was this very small revelation that God had given me, um, which is just so incredibly neat. Um, it doesn't state as plainly as the prior example with Caiaphas, but whenever we're dealing with these types and shadows, we have to be very careful with symbology, making sure that there's an abundance of evidence to make such a claim. And so I'm gonna show you, um, you know, all the evidence that supports uh, this small little revelation here. So in this instance, it's in Pentecost. This is in Acts chapter 2. This is when the Holy Spirit descended on the apostles, emboldening them to share the good news with the world. And they came out from the upper room where they were hiding, and they went out into the streets, and they were you know, basically pronouncing the mighty good works of God. And they were speaking in tongues. So men of many nations were able to understand what they were saying, each in their own tongue. And they were looking at one another like, how can this be? How can we all understand these men? Um, it was an absolute miracle. And so in Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 5, we'll go ahead and read here. I'll just paraphrase a little bit. It says, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Then through verses 9 through 11, it goes through all the different countries and the different languages, and yet everyone can understand what they're saying. And it says, We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God, and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to, other, saying to one another, What does this mean? But here is the best verse out of all of it. 
And this is something that uh, I previously overlooked in terms of just one, one little verse and, and how much it actually means. I, I overlooked it. Uh, verse 13 says, But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. Now, when you read that, um, you, you basically adhere to what the mockers are saying and saying, oh, look, these mockers are making fun of the apostles and saying they're drunk. They don't even know what they're talking about, regardless of what your definitions of speaking in tongues is. Um, if you think that it's more the Arabic type tongue, um, you can see these mockers are probably looking at these apostles and they don't have the gift of interpretation. They're saying, oh, look at these guys, they're drunk. Or if you adhere to the tongue where it was just literally speaking in the actual language. Um, these mockers may have actually understood what the apostles were saying, but it made absolutely no sense to them because the gospel is a folly to those who are perishing. Whatever your inter interpretation of tongues is regarding this small little re revelation doesn't really matter. What matters is these unbelievers who were mocking were looking at the apostles and saying, these guys are drunk. They're on new wine and they're talking about just literally getting drunk in the physical sense. But little did they know, and little did I know when I read this prior, maybe little did you know when you read this prior, that they were actually speaking a prophetic word because the apostles were indeed filled with new wine. Um, so this is an exact replica of Caiaphas the high priest being an unbeliever speaking prophetic words. You have mockers here saying the apostles were drunk, I'm saying something from a physical sense, but spiritually it's very prophetic. Spiritually, the apostles were literally filled with new wine. So if you don't know what that means, um, I'm actually going to edit in my video on the parable of the wine and wineskins and what the symbol of wine means in terms of the covenant, the new covenant that we're in, and you'll fully understand why it's so prophetic that these mockers were saying the apostles are filled on new wine. Um, just as a tidbit before I start rolling this clip for you, in Matthew 26, it says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine, fruit of the vine being grapes, it is indeed wine in that cup, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so the new covenant of grace through faith via belief in Jesus Christ as your Savior to forgive you from your sins, um, it is new wine. It is new wine that is poured out for you. And it is new wine that the apostles were literally filled with, exactly what the mockers had said but just from a slightly different perspective. So, um, this parable of the wine and wineskins, which you can find in Matthew 9, 17. Um, let's just go ahead and listen to that teaching. If you've already seen that video, or if you already understand what the parable is, I hope um, this small little revelation blessed you and made you smile as well. It's, it's, it's these little things that are not necessarily hidden in Scripture. Um, but at some point when the time is right, they just sort of pop out at you. And you see that the word is living, it is truth. Um, it's not just static text written by the hands of men. It is inspired, it is God breath. And um, you know, when you see these things come out as such, uh, you just, you really just start to see the divine beauty and intricacy of God's word and, and his scripture. So let's roll the clip. The parable of the wine and wineskins that Jesus gave is a culmination of the past four teachings I've done on the law of the spirit versus the law in sin and death. Not only that, it exemplifies why Jesus is the Messiah. The intricacy and beauty of this parable done on such short notice in front of the crowds could not have been done by any mere man, only the Messiah. The parable goes like this, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. The physical interpretation of this parable is that the wineskin is made of leather, and the wine that they put in it would be fermented and expand. If you used an old wineskin that was brittle, and the wine expanded, it would burst the entire wineskin. 
but if you had a fresh wineskin that was pliable, it would expand when the wine fermented and both would be preserved. But to understand the true meaning of this parable, we only need to look at the symbols of wine and wineskins. The wine is the covenant of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We find that in Matthew 26, and he took the cup, which was wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And as for the wineskin, we know that it's a vessel for the wine, but specifically in Psalm 119 verse 83, King David says, for I have become like a wineskin in the smoke, yet I have not forgotten your statutes. So we see that this wineskin vessel somehow relates to our body, but yet there is an old and a new. Well, what is that? We find the answer in John 3. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now that we have the pieces of the puzzle together, what does this mean? Paraphrased, it would say, when you are born again, your spirit or soul is a new vessel. It drinks a spiritual drink, which is the new covenant. You are living by the law of the spirit of life through Jesus Christ. You bear fruit of the spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things where there is no law. You uphold the entirety of the law and that of the prophets by the two greatest commandments that Jesus spoke of, loving God with all your heart and soul and loving your neighbor as yourself. But what about the old wineskin, which is that of the flesh? The old wineskin is people's attempt to perfect their flesh through the law of sin and death. It is incompatible with the new covenant. Things such as eating only clean meats, circumcision of the flesh, and other physical requirements of the old law does not make one more holy or more righteous. All these physical aspects of the law are parables in and of themselves, which have higher spiritual meanings. We can see in Galatians 3, they are actually chastised by Paul for trying to perfect their flesh through the law of sin and death, even though they have been given the truth to live through Christ by the law of the Spirit. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? To all my brothers and sisters in Christ, let no one tell you that you must follow the Torah out of obedience. You fulfill the Torah, the law of sin and death, and all the prophets by living out the fruit of the Spirit and by living by the two greatest commandments that Jesus Christ spoke to you. Let no one give you condemnation. For anyone that wants to pursue physical aspects of the Torah, like eating clean meats or other aspects, know that this is only for your physical body and that you must condemn no one else in pursuits of these things. It does not make you more holy. It does not make you more righteous. I hope that this interpretation of the parable has blessed you. This is Mike with On Point Preparedness.